Hello, and welcome to the Profitable Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberly Rich, and as the founder of the Bold Life Movement and a fellow coach for more than seven years, I know the challenges that many of you face when launching or growing your coaching business. And I'm here to pull back the curtain on the coaching industry and help you overcome roadblocks to make the impact you were born to make. Each week, I'll be interviewing successful coaches from every corner of the industry to share exactly how they have managed to generate massive impact and income. From strategy to psychology, we cover it all. This show is presented to you by Transformation Academy, a global marketplace of courses and coaching certifications. So whether you are already part of our Epic community or you're brand new to this show, If you're ready to learn what it takes to turn your passion for service into a profitable business, then keep listening. You are in the right place. Welcome back to the Profitable Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberly Rich, and this is episode 11 with my dear friend, Melanie Weinberger. Melanie is a very impressive young woman. She has spoken on stages all over the world, and you can tell in this episode what a masterful coach and purposeful speaker that she is. You can see how much work she's done on both herself as an individual, on her skills as a coach, and on her savvy as a businesswoman. And I was really excited to bring her expertise to the show because I think that around every corner there is a nugget of wisdom that aspiring and new coaches can benefit from. So I'm not going to waste any more of your time. Go ahead and hit subscribe, hit follow on that podcast app and buckle up because you are in for a really powerful episode. Without further ado, please welcome Melanie Weinberger. Welcome back to the Profitable Coach Podcast. I am joined today by a dear friend and fellow coach, Miss Melanie Weinberger. Welcome to the show, Mel. Thank you. So happy to be here with you, Cam. So this is really exciting for me because I have watched Mel grow as a coach, as an entrepreneur, and as a speaker since we first became friends while I was living in Austin gosh, like seven years ago. And we were part of this group of women called the Wonder Women (laughs) who all supported each other in growing their businesses and just being better versions of themselves. And and so it's really cool for me to invite Mel on to today after watching her career sort of blossom and her life blossom over the past few years. So Mel, will you give us a little bit of context as to how you initially got drawn to coaching? as a career? Yeah. um, Well, I started my career in advertising, like in the corporate world. And I was always Little Miss Sunshine. Like I ended up being head of culture for this huge um, agency called Digitas or like leading like the culture committee or something. And then at my next agency, I led learning and development and was like the mentor in the office. And um, I remember noticing the difference between what it looked like and how a team performed when an account manager kicked off a team with positivity and when an account manager kicked off a team with like, oh, the clients want changes and it's so annoying and how palpable it would be like a gray cloud came in the room. And I, I, yeah, Mm -hmm. so I always had this positive stance and, um, that took me, I followed that intuitive way of being. Um, and I always, uh, the other thing I guess it correlated with was I was always into well being. Um, and it started as a, a physical interest. I was a runner forever for like a little less than two decades, maybe. And um, I was a writer about, I wrote about running in the newspapers in Brooklyn. I had a column in the Williamsburg News and Art. And then I was a blogger about it. And then I started a business about it. And I thought, if I can run every day, you can too. And that's kind of when I started going direct to people, kind of motivating. And over the years, that morphed into um, running. I, I launched a corporate wellness business and I started bringing well-being classes into corporations I liked doing that so much. I decided to hire myself as a teacher into those corporations and started giving lectures on um, 
flow state and how we create from the inside out. And then it turns out I'm a really good public speaker, which wasn't like, it wasn't like a fact that I knew it was kind of like reflected back to me in the world. And so then I started getting invited speaking at people's like summits or uh, like graduations for coding academies in Austin. And, uh, and then at the end of those uh, talks, people would come up and want more. And I started getting private clients. Um, and that's kind of the nexus of how coaching began for me. I want to rewind just a little bit because we have so many coaches in the Transformation Academy community who want to bring their new insights, these notions around well-being and joy and balance to corporate environments. And yet they struggle to get yeses from the gatekeepers at these companies. So can you speak a little bit to how it was that you got your foot in the door and were able to be hired on by these companies? Yeah. Corporate gigs are hard. I don't recommend it. <laughs> If you're going to choose that, you've got to be, uh, the way that I saw the playing field play out is this, either you are going to be a short-term consultant and you'll get hired for a few lectures, or you'll get hired to lead yoga weekly or something like that, or you are a big boy player and you're getting hired by enterprise to run the gyms at the company or you are like mm -hmm. the Calm app and you have a huge back end that can support hundreds or thousands of people and can give a discount code mm -hmm. and can give user metrics back. And if those are the, those are the two camps. And so either you're going to get onesie twosie lectures or be the yoga instructor, or you have to be full on enterprise, which is building a corporate I mean, then you're building a business that's really going to scale, which is a totally different thing than bringing yeah. meditation into a corporate office. If you do want to do the thing where you bring meditation into a corporate office, there are um, generally three ways you can get in. One is through HR. HR can typically approve a budget. They can easily say yes to something around $500. Once you go over $2,000, they have to get approval from someone else. Typically, it has to go up to the CFO. I, when I did corporate wellness, my biggest contracts were around 40 k So I was selling all kinds of on-site classes, plus we had a um, uh, piece of software to run wellness challenges on. And people would buy, so they would buy, we'll do yoga once a week, we'll do massage day once a month, we'll do a monthly well-being lecture, and we're going to run four wellness challenges this year. So they'd buy that for 40K, but, but marketing well-being inside a company is a whole other thing, and it requires buy-in from the C-suite and all of the directors. Mm -hmm. And if there isn't buy-in from the C-suite and the directors, then the employees don't feel like they can go. It doesn't feel like a mm. an actual supported thing in the culture. And so what was what happened to us was the attrition level was super high and people would start going to yoga and then stop going somewhere around month three and then they would cancel the program. Like they wouldn't renew the contract mm. at the end of the year. It takes around two and a half months to close a corporate deal because it's all relationships. And then if they don't stay for more than a year, that churn rate doesn't actually support a business. So we were kind of somewhere in the middle of the onesie twosies and the big boys, and it, it wasn't a sustainable model. But if you're just trying to get, if you just have, you can't help it. You're meant to do this in the world and you have to go teach meditation inside companies, price your meditation classes somewhere between three to 500 per with, with no cap on how many people can attend get some mm -hmm. survey metrics at the end that proves that people feel better, deliver those metrics and get as many gigs as you can um, is what I would say. And see if you can get a director to come. Marketing internally is a challenge. If you can get the CEO to come, then that's the bee's knees. 
Um, the other two people you could sell into is the C-suite itself, which is generally harder to get access to unless you're already networked in with CEOs and like that's who you homie with. Um, mm -hmm. And the other way you can get in is the director of a team. Often the director of sales is someone who will hire in a well-being coach or a positivity coach or a meditation coach because sales is so psychologically stressful. Uh, and so mm -hmm. you could get hired and they have budget. Well, that's what I got on corporate. Super helpful. Super helpful. Are there particular industries or sized companies that are more likely to opt for a wellness program and hire someone like, like you? Yeah, a company over 100 people and you want a company that has the culture of a young tech startup, like they play ping pong in the office and like that kind of vibe, like you can bring your dog to work. Yeah. That's who's going to buy a wellness yeah. program. Yeah, that checks out. <laughs> <laughs> and so was this something that you were doing um, before Mindlight or was this the early days of Mindlight? A little of both. This was what I did before okay. Mindlight solo. Um, it was called well shift and I did it for seven years and I had our claim to fame was we ran all of Google's wellness programs for the state of Texas. Um, and then after well shift, Mindlight actually started in corporate, um, because that's mm -hmm. what I knew how to do. And we weren't getting traction there. It was just kind of the same thing over and over again. Like people would buy a $1,200 90-minute training, and then that's kind of where it would end. And so we would work these relationships mm -hmm. with the Googles, the YMCA, the, you know, but it wouldn't turn into something long-lasting. And so we pivoted away from focusing on corporate, realizing that we actually need a full kind of software suite that would come maybe seven years down the line in the maturity of the business. And so I'm hearing that in the lifespan of your entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial journey and your journey as being someone who wants to make a difference, there's been a lot of pivots, right? There was oh, yeah. <laughs> first serving as like a writer about, about running and then launching well shift and then moving into uh, mind light. And what were some of the, the new beliefs that you had to have or the mindset shifts that you had to have each time you did pivot? Cause I think a lot of new coaches are like, I'm going to be a coach. And they think it's going to look this one way forever. And that's just not the reality of launching a business. Yeah. There's two things I would say uh, that guided me. One is intuition. So when I pivoted into corporate wellness, that wasn't a mindset shift. That was just an experiment. I didn't actually intend to launch a corporate wellness business. Um, I just didn't have, honestly, I was trying to get more readers on my blog and I started featuring, I got this idea to start featuring personal trainers. And then I got this idea to start kind of like, selling classes for the personal trainers and taking a cut and it wasn't getting enough traction. And I thought maybe if I can get into corporate and advertise us, then we'll get some traction. And then they started buying packages from me. And then I was like, Oh my gosh, I have a corporate wellness business. That was an accident. And then I went full on. So that was just kind of like experimenting. Um, yeah. Whereas other pivots, here's something that's really important. Um, other pivots happen with a hard look at reality. And that can get missed, especially if you're like the super optimistic, visionary, uh, dreamland kind of coach, because you'll look at the numbers not working and you'll say, but I know I can make it next month. Or like, I know it's possible and keep skipping mm -hmm. on what's actually happening. And then, uh, that doesn't end well. So you have to actually <laughs> like be with what's real. Like if the numbers are going red, they're actually going red and a pivot is required immediately. And so, so mm -hmm. sometimes it's like financially strategic or like financially strategic because the market's not picking it up, you know, which is you have to call it, what, it, what is it? Call a spade a spade. Spade a spade. Yeah. And when <laughs> did you decide to bring on a partner and why? For Mindlight. 
So Mind Light, I do have a, I have two business partners. Um, the third one came on later, but the first one, she kind of hit on me business wise. <laughs> I was wrapping up uh, Well Shift and we both spoke at the same retreat on different topics. And I think reputationally, Austin, for anyone who's listening who doesn't live in Austin, um, it's a it's a biggish city, but it's also really community oriented and somewhat small. And so kind of everyone knows everyone somehow in the circles you run in. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. um, Lillian, my business partner, heard that I was running a corporate wellness thing. A lot of a lot of wellness people in town did know that. And she wanted to bring her curriculum into corporate wellness and asked me if I would help her. And I was starstruck by her. I thought she was incredible. And I said, yes. And that's how it started. So that's how the business partnership started. I wasn't necessarily seeking a partnership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've heard similar stories on other episodes where it was you know, sort of organic, like people bonded over similar goals, complementary skill sets, and then nurtured the relationship. And that's how something evolved. It wasn't just like seeing a mentor wanting to work with them and immediately uh, like slipping into their DMs and trying to land them. Like there's some coaxing, some flirtation. Like you said, she hit on you. She hit on me. And then we ran a three month experiment to see how, if we had we had something on our hands that was worth um, investing in and the business experiment failed, but we loved each other. And so mm -hmm. that was what we learned. And so we decided to go into business together. Um, I will say that going into business with someone is a huge, huge deal. And there isn't a right answer whether to go solo or whether to go in partnership. They both have their pluses and minuses. Um, but if you're considering going in a partnership with someone, it's so, so very important to understand what your own values are and what their values are, what your vision is for your life, what their vision is for their life, mm -hmm. and be really honest if they don't line up. And um, I don't recommend thinking, well, I can like get into that. I can see what you're throwing down because years down the line, it turns into a much bigger thing. But if you have congruency, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> you said a word now three times that I want to call out because I think it's a really useful word for people who are brand new to something. And that was experiment. So will you speak a little bit more about how you've leaned into this concept of experimentation in your coaching with one-on-one -on -one clients and the evolution of uh, MindLight? Um, yeah, ideas aren't the truth. Ideas aren't the answer. They're in inspired creativity. Um, but it doesn't mean that the whole world also wants what you think is the answer or the truth. Um, and so it's a much more friendly way psychologically to enter into testing it to think of it as an experiment rather than thinking of it as the way mm. and when you think of it as an experiment when the numbers and you have to be honest with your numbers aren't doing what you thought they do you get to be honest really quickly and cut the cord and pivot on the experiment so you don't blow your whole budget or your whole savings or and also protect yourself from feeling like i'm a failure uh, one thing that I learned over the years that is like still a very active practice for me somehow after all my experience is not confusing my identity with my business. So mm. the experiment failed, but I didn't. I'm not a failure. The experiment wasn't successful, but I successfully ran an experiment. It is really, really, yeah. really helpful to pull yourself apart from the results of your business and the value of yourself as a human being. Um, and really everything, yeah. businesses are experiments forever, forever, ever, because the world's always changing and you're changing and your team's changing and you're going to want to launch a new product and this product's going to get tired and you're going to get tired of teaching that course and you're going to try teaching this course and mm -hmm. um, you, you never know. 
<laughs> you never have the answer. Um, so yeah, sort of like easing up on having to know the way versus testing into many ways and seeing what mm -hmm. works. And, you know, any business book that you read about the longevity of a business, uh, case in point, like really famous one, Good to Great by I think Jim Collins, they say somewhere in there that when a, whenever a business thinks that they've they figured it out and they start to become static, they immediately fail and die. So it's mm -hmm. always experimenting, always innovating, because the world is changing. So this is yeah. kind of the reality. Yeah. I didn't I realize I said that this three weekend. times. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it landed. And, and, and I really appreciated it because I think that it's a really important concept for especially new coaches or new entrepreneurs to like have in their toolbox to protect themselves from quitting early or losing their sense of self to their business, especially if they are creating what we call a personal brand. That can be really confusing sometimes when your life, your personality becomes the like core element of what is drawing people in to buy from you. And so if they stop buying from you, what meaning are you making that about you? And and how can you shift that? Um, uh, what I was what I was starting to say was that I was at a conference this weekend called the Millionaire Minds Multi Millionaire Mindset Intensive, based off of T. Harv Eker's teachings, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. And one of the things that stood out was uh, the speaker said, "If you're not changing your marketing every 30 days, then you're stale because the economy's shifting, culture's shifting." politics are shifting, your customers' problems are shifting. And and I think that being in that state of constantly evolving and running new experiments can just help you be more fluid and less attached to uh, one particular product or message or client or outcome and, and understanding that's always iterative. Yeah, I do want to um, name an exception to that rule, which is my friend Jolie Dawn, who you should totally get yes. on this podcast. She's a very successful coach. Yes. And she, yeah. we were just literally hanging out two days ago and she was like, yeah, I'm kind of on, um, uh, the word she used were rinse and repeat, not in a, not in a boring way, but in a like, I've got a system and it works. And yeah. so sometimes you can have a system that works. I, I don't want to scare people listening, thinking like you have to have complete, like brand new creative, brand new strategy every 30 days. Cause that can be a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I imagine she's bringing in fresher partnerships each time or like there's some kind of new, new air breathed into it or a revamp, mm -hmm. but you can have sustainable well, systems. And I think what is an element of Jolie's marketing that does constantly evolve is she shares her life. She's really leaned into the personal brand thing. So she keeps her stories fresh. She's very vulnerable and transparent. And so I think that following along her journey is what keeps people coming back. I mean, I've been friends with her for, I don't know, seven, eight years now. And she's one of the emails that I still open of the million newsletter lists that I'm on. Because I just love hearing what's going on in her world. That's so beautiful. Yeah, good point. I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's definitely on my list of people to, to have on this show. I think that she'd be a really beautiful example. Cool. So what is uh, one of the most important things that you think coaches could or should be investing in? Um. Is it too cheesy and cliche to say their own well-being? No. <laughs> I mean, every coach needs a coach. Every coach needs, you got to scrub your own floors. If you're going to be scrubbing other people's floors, you got to be good at it. And the, the most uh, appropriate testing grounds is your own psyche before mm -hmm. it's other people's. How does it really work to keep yourself in balance and inspired and well? Um, be the role model. Not to say to be perfect, because I think there's a trap in coaching where you have to be making millions, you have to have the house, the clothes, the whatever, because 
you have to prove that your mindset and your, you know, everything's perfect. I don't think that's true. There's, we're all human. And I think it's perfectly yeah. good to share the humanity, you know, and then come out, come sh show the arc of what you've been through. Um, but I see a lot of coaches who aren't doing their own work and it makes for a dirty session, meaning you're bringing your, like you're bringing your dirty floor into the session with your client and the results aren't going to be great. So maintaining your own clear headspace, being like reinvesting in your why, why am I doing this? Um, and investing in your mind and your well-being as the first testing ground. Because if you're going to be all about other people living their best lives and you're not, I mean, what's the point of that? Yeah, 100%. You know? And I yeah. can fully admit that I have fallen prey to the trap of thinking that I needed to have certain things figured out to be a good coach. And, you know, it's, it's a beautiful reminder that you can have growth happening in one area of life and still be crushing it in another and still be totally able to support people in that other area. And then maybe in the future, because of the growth that you went through over here, you're able to help other people move through that type of pain or that type of growth more easily because you have the experience with it. Um, oh, absolutely. I also think, yeah. And, and also I've never been a better coach than when I'm being coached because I'm seeing what's working. <laughs> you know, I pull exercises or powerful questions or whatever tools that my coach has in his or her toolbox into my own sessions. And so that, is a, another great reason that coaches need coaches. <laughs> coaches need coaches, man. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. On the flip side of that, how has being a coach impacted your own life? Um, what ways have you shifted because you are coaching others? Gosh. Well, I just love it so much many ways. So, um, well at Mindlight, I've played a lot of roles. So Mindlight for everyone listening, Mindlight is an emotional training company and we train coaches and how to be masterful at working with their clients' emotions. And then all of our mm -hmm. graduates and myself and my co-founders, um, see private clients. And so in, in that, in Mindlight Institute, I've been a trainer, I've been a mentor, I've been an advisor, or I've, I've led mentorship. It's like a two-year institute. Like, just imagine, like, kind of, kind of like a coaching university kind of thing. Um, and number one, coaching coaches is very inspiring, mm -hmm. especially if you have a model. Like, we have a model where our student coaches give each other sessions. Like, we teach a technique, and then they swap and the trainers are watching um maybe with the camera off on zoom everything we do is is online right now and you watch someone else give someone a miracle it's so freaking cool it's so inspiring and so it just like you know i would leave a lot of the mentorship classes in tears oh my gosh like we it's happening we're spreading a miracle that's spreading a miracle that's going to spread hundreds of miracles it's going to spread thousands of miracles it's um, and it brings, I think the number one answer probably to your question is that it brings well-being into my body. It brings well-being into mm -hmm. my body to watch other people heal other people. And when I'm channeling for a client, when I'm the bridge to well-being for the person across from me, it's like divinity is pouring through me and it, cl it cleans, it cleans me. <laughs> and sometimes I leave a session being like, man, I want that session. That was a great session. Like whatever I said to <laughs> them is what I needed to hear today. Thank you so much for that. That was great. <laughs> um, so I, I get, you know, I want my number one value in life right now is alignment. And mm. I um, calibrate alignment by feeling how open and um, good feeling is the energy in my body while I'm engaging in something. 
how is my general vitality in life? When I, th when I think of this thing, does excitement come into my body or does heaviness come into my body? Um, and is it, does it make sense for the natural constitution of who I am? Like we all have our own natural mm -hmm. constitution, introverted or extroverted or um, loves playing sports, hates playing sports. There's just a, a makeup that we all have. And am I fighting my makeup or am I working with my natural makeup? Uh, and for me, I find when I'm sitting across from a client, I'm in total freaking alignment. The energy's on, I'm open, I'm alive. It's fun. Their lives are changing, which is so, what an honor. And it's like the best yeah. hour ever. And I was like, wow, I just got paid for that. That was incredible. That was like, I'm definitely in the right place. Um, and, and I don't find that particular high voltage thing isn't absolutely everywhere in my reality. It's in certain places in my reality. And that is yeah. one of them. And so that is one of the big things I get out of it is just that human experience. <laughs> Are you ever in a coaching session when that feeling of alignment isn't the case? And do you attribute, if so, do you attribute it to a bad fit? Like they're just not the ideal client for your unique set of skills, or is it, Maybe you haven't filled your own cup before coming to the session. Can you speak to that at all? Because I imagine some people listening have felt that, but newer coaches might still be so in their head about their ability to serve that they haven't tapped into that yet. You nailed it with those two. And there's one more that I'll add. So first, um, I might be under-resourced, which is the second thing you said. And that, that totally makes a session suck. It's like, I didn't sleep last night or um, I just got some really bad news and I'm really need to cry, but I'm going to hold it in till the session's over or something like that or have a headache. Um, mm -hmm. That, yeah, that sucks. So that would be one reason would be, to be being <laughs> under-resourced. Um, and then the second reason it kind of can be split into two and you named it is like this client is just not the right fit for me. Uh, that is so real. And, um, I want, I couldn't like put it in red lights more for everyone who's listening. Don't work with clients who are not the right fit for you. It is not a win for you and it is not a win for them. The sessions won't go well. You're not going to feel good. And the strategy of like, oh, well, I'm just going to work on myself and clear my trigger around people who express that way before the next session is a really, um, really tough, stressful setup. And there's no guarantee that you're going to actually clear the root of where, whatever trauma that trigger is operating off of. And now that client is going to be like battlegrounds for you. And the second you get triggered in the session, that whole session is going to fold. And I'm sure people listening have had that experience. So there's two ways to avoid that. Um, one is test out if you don't do discovery calls and they're just booking you and it's a, it's a first session, whatever it is, in your first interaction, test out if your medicine works for them. And if you like them, you get to like your clients. And if you sit across yeah. from this person and you feel all the light leave your body or um, you feel like you just gave them your, the, the, you gave them all of yourself and nothing happened. Like they didn't get mm -hmm. any results and you couldn't get in there for some reason probably just not your client and right away to say, you know, I think I'd love to refer you out. I have someone who'd be a perfect fit for you and refer them out. It's great to refer them out. You, they'll, you want them to get results. Yeah. You don't want to force anything. Yeah. The second thing that could happen is that that client's actually out of scope for you. And this is what I was talking about when I say like, if you get triggered by the client or you get triggered by the client's content. So if you, mm -hmm. If you had a car accident two weeks ago and you're still kind of wobbly from that and haven't had a chance to like really clear, really heal your body and your mind, and someone wants to book you to work on a car accident they had two days ago, the second they start talking about the car accident, you're going to go into a stress response. We would call that out of scope. Or if you mm -hmm. had sexual assault experience in your uh, childhood, I'm being a little extreme here, but 
let's say that happened and it's not fully yeah. cleared, you haven't have fully had the chance to dive in and clean that wound, probably working with people with childhood sexual abuse is going to be out of scope. And so you just don't take mm -hmm. those clients. If you can't hold the content, you can't hold the client and you just make that clean rule and you, you refer them out. So those are some, some reasons it could go wrong. I love that. What have been some of the tools or mentors or training that you have um, invested in over the years to be a good coach, to know what is within your scope? My, my biggest mentor has been Lillian Moore, who's my co-founder. Um, mm. She started um, her healing work when she was 19. So yeah. I met her, she already was having, she had like 15 years of experience. And because we launched our business as co-founders, I basically entered into an apprenticeship. Um, mm. And we've been working together for six years now. We're not in that sort of apprenticeship uh, container anymore. It's almost like to some degree I, I graduated, but. Um... <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I got a lot of, of very high quality attention uh, from her and from working right next to her, from learning her curriculum, from receiving a lot of sessions from her, from being coached by her. Um, so, and that would be my light, everyone. I'm so, so it's like slight promo for <laughs> the institute that I run, Mind Light. Um, the website is themindlight.com spelled how you think it's spelled like regular spelling um <laughs> so yeah like a, a close apprenticeship with a master um and then there's like some modalities that I just picked up along the way because I was looking for tools that hit harder like for example psych k is a fabulous modality psych p s y s yeah p s y c h and then the letter k and mm. it's a modality that support someone in shifting their beliefs into supportive beliefs versus unsupportive beliefs, but does so somatically so that it's not just, mm. it's not a mantra. It's not a sticky note you're putting on your mirror and saying to yourself every morning for 30 days and hoping that it becomes true. It's a way of actually finding a belief that can fully land in your body as a yes in this moment. So resoundingly yes in your body that you're now actually shifting your operating system to that belief from the one you were believing before. And it's fabulous. Mm. So there's so many like modalities hidden in caves out there because they decided yeah. not to build a marketing team and raise a round of funding and scale their, you know, brand. Uh, matrix re-imprinting yeah. is another technique like that. And there's a book called Matrix Re-imprinting mm. Using EFT. Uh, EFT stands mm. for Emotional Freedom Technique. Matrix is used to heal trauma. And specifically used to heal a traumatic moment or event. And it's a technique where um, you, you're actually working with the energy body of the trauma without ever having to have the client tell you what happened or relive it. It creates almost mm. two layers of... Um, two layers of safety from the client having the opportunity to get re-traumatized, which is the most important thing you can do in trauma work is not bring too much pain into the body all at once, which would create overwhelm, which would create uh, re-traumatizing or a second trauma by trying to work with the first trauma without enough skill and how to approach that pain with yeah. pace, the right pace. Um, so it's another technique and that if you already are practicing EFT, read that book, Matrix Re-Imprinting Using EFT and the book will skill, like, and then give yourself sessions. Um, so so those are, I would say, my main oh. two ways. Where I, I'm a big reader, reading books. I had a really tight apprenticeship for about five years. Um, and then just poking around on the internet to find modalities that would hit better than tools I had. And then I would hire coaches who were graduated in that modality and have them mm. give me sessions and then figure out what they were doing and then do it. Genius. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's a really 
important reminder that yes, we can get educated from books. We can get educated from courses, but nothing's going to hit the way experience hits. And so getting to really like be a, a, a student of that modality as the client uh, is going to, it's just going to let it land in a different way. Totally. And I, I would say one of the, the, the experience, what you just said, another thing to put in red lights. At MindLight, we pair, every student gets paired with other students to give and receive sessions. That experience is what makes an embodied coach. Having had mm-hmm. a successful session in your own body, you healed from a traumatic yeah. event. Now you have a knowing that people can heal from traumatic events because you did it. And so the embodiment yeah. you have, the confidence you have as a coach when you speak Clients want someone who who they can feel knows the way. That's what they're they're gonna pay for before they've experienced you. If they can feel it in your body, um, yeah, yeah. Which would you say you all lean into more, helping people to heal from past things, or helping people to focus on the future and and like move towards goals? And I know that's kind of a nuanced difference, but hopefully it's you not. What I'm we saying. have two completely separate courses for one of each of those. Okay. Um, we have a course on trauma integration. That's an 18 week training course for practitioners, teaching them how to heal even the most intense psychological wounds. And I always, I always do a spectrum. That's on this side. And the other side, the, <laughs> we don't actually really work with accountability. Because accountability to me means you're overriding something in this person's system that doesn't want to do something. That actually needs some Mm -hmm. attention to get cleared up because when you're in alignment, Mm -hmm. things feel good and you want to do them. But we call the other side of the spectrum human potential, which is how do I allow the limitlessness of my experience to expand, 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 expand? How can I have every idea that I've thought I've wanted to feel have happened? How can I get out of my own way and reduce resistance and to, and allow? Um, so, so that's how we teach the two of what you just said. Um, but in the truth is that in session with a client, it's never completely siloed. You're never right. only giving a trauma session and you're never, I mean, you can, you can, but trauma technically lives inside human potential because To even think you can heal something means you have to be in the possibility of being different. You have to be in the possibility that Mm. I can feel different. And so you're touching both worlds. And typically when you're working with a client, if you're doing trauma work, which is, is, you know, healing an emotional wound or wounds, um, when, when the body starts to really clear the pain, Now you've got someone with a whole lot of white space available and you want training on the other side as well so that you can call in a new emotional state to say, well, who do you get to be now? And what would that feel like? And so, um, in that way, in our work, we're calling them into a new beingness and there are new actions that would come from a new being. Uh, A lot of the foundation of what we teach comes back to what, who are you? What is your natural constitution? Mm -hmm. And how can we be a yes for that? How can we discover it, Mm -hmm. be a yes for it and help it grow versus like holding you accountable to in 30 days, you're going to have done 300 outreaches. It's more Mm -hmm. like, does it bring you life? Do you feel excited about reaching out to X people and building those relationships? And if it doesn't, there's no aliveness there, then that wouldn't be a place that I would coach someone into. Um, <clears throat> How do you differentiate between identifying someone's natural constitution and not perpetuating them, putting themselves in boxes that are limiting? And let me give you a quick example. I identify as an Enneagram 7, as a generator as an Aries sun, Pisces moon. And in a lot of ways, those identifications or those labels help me feel more accepting of my current way of being and more understanding of myself. And I, on the flip side of that, can see how 
I might not do something or I might justify not having to do something because it's not the way that I am. It's not the way that I'm built. How do you work with someone um, and, and help them expand the way that they are versus contract into a box? The coach in me really wants to give you a session and wants to ask you if you can get more specific <laughs> and we could dive into what you're working with there. Um, but I won't do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have like 15 minutes, but <laughs> yeah. I'm open to being vulnerable on the air. Let's save that for um, podcast number two when we do our next one. Love it. I love it. <laughs> okay. So identities are tools. They're mm -hmm. not uh, the truth. They're the truth as you choose them to be. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate sovereign being chooses moment to moment what being they're going to operate from. The, it's the being before the doing thing. And so if being the Enneagram 7 puts you in the experience of yourself from the inside out that you want to be in that moment, if it puts you into an energy that gives you access to the you you want to have at that party or to the you that you want to have in front of your client, perfect. Jump into Enneagram 7. Um, mm -hmm. If it doesn't, then we back out of it's like the double, the, the observer. So there's the me that's the Enneagram seven. There's the me that's watching me live into the Enneagram seven. We lean back mm -hmm. out into observer and say, who do I want to be in this moment that would serve the experience I want to have? And we try on a different identity. Uh, and just getting used to popping out of uh, identities and popping in and trying on new ones is, is one way. Um, but also... If something doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel good. So you could say, I'm an introvert, but today I'm going to be an extrovert. And you could pop into extrovert and everything in your body is a no. Well, that got, that was a no. So <laughs> maybe you don't go to those. Maybe going to those huge parties just actually isn't in your natural constitution. Um, yeah. But the thing about experience is that's freeing is to know that like they're actually all trainable emotions are trainable so experiences are emotions running through your your biological being and emotions uh, you can tap into them th by choosing them like right now i can decide to get curious and experience curiosity and i feel this bubble come up and then i want to lean into you and look at you ask you all these questions and that's a uh, psychological choosing, asking my body for a feeling, and then I get a secretion of hormones, and now I am being curious. And I can train mm -hmm. into that by practicing feeling it. You can train into mm -hmm. being adventurous, even if you feel like you don't have the resources to like get on a flight to Paris right now, like everyone else on Instagram is doing. You can close your eyes yeah. and feel okay. the feeling of adventure in your body. And that being yeah. place will change the way you experience your house. Maybe you'll go sit in a chair you never sit in and it'll just feel silly. And then maybe you'll drive a different way to your friend's house and notice an ice cream shop you've never been to. Um, so you can train into new ways of being as well. And I would say, again, it's all a bunch of experimenting, but above all things in this popping in and out of identities and in and out of emotions, there is a true north usually that people's spirits are calling them to. There are like repeated visions that people get, repeated desires that people get. And I orient to these as like sort of higher self downloads or higher self clues. And generally your higher self isn't trying to trick you or hurt you. Um, and so if we keep getting the same vision over and over again, it might be worth training into and trying on the identities and the emotional um, embodiments internally that have us be be towards that v vision of us we're having because I don't, I don't necessarily yeah. think those visions are accidental. And I also don't think that we choose them. They come to us and they're just there. Why do you like chocolate ice yeah. cream and want it right now? I'm not sure. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I want to follow this vein uh, a little bit with another question that I've been wanting to ask. So that question is, 
for individuals who are launching a business because they want to be a coach and they feel really, really excited by the idea of working with people. And maybe they're like the visionary and the, the people person, they're the face of this, this new venture, but the business side that is required to make that vision come to life and be sustainable is not in their current wheelhouse. So how do we train into some of the more left brain? And this is a personal question I'm asking because I experienced this and have experienced it for the past eight years. How do you train yourself into these more left brain activities that your body is saying, I don't like this. I'm not good at this. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's. So think of your energy as a bank account. And if when you dip into those identities, it pulls from your bank account. You just have to be mindful to not go too negative and then mm. flip back into the part of you that fills you up. You, there is a certain amount of attention and grit and determination that people can bring into anything and make anything happen. And if it's not your natural constitution, it will drain your energy out. Um, and yeah. so that's what I would say. And I know that in the beginning, we don't all have the budget to hire the virtual assistant or the bookkeeper. Um, so it takes something. It takes an energetic investment. It really does mm -hmm. um, to get it going and training into it. The way that I've done it is I, I call it going into a portal. <laughs> And I, for example, I've been Mindlight CEO for almost two years. I mean, not CEO, although I am CEO, but CFO. Mm. Um, I'm not a CFO, dude. No, like definitely not. This is Absolutely why I ask, because I feel like we have <laughs> overlap in some of our natural gifts, you know? Um, so I just, I call it going into a portal and I put on a good jam and I, I, no, I like block off eight the whole day or six hours and I become the person who builds spreadsheets and I get into flow state that really, really helps. That's why I do that. I get it. the flow state mm -hmm. really helps keep me in it, in the zone. And I put it on my calendar once a month and I create, I make it fun by doing that. Like once a month, I'm going in the portal, got the jams on. I go somewhere I like to be. And I, and I don't let anything pull me out of the portal so that I'm mm. choosing, I'm choosing how and when I'm going into the energy that isn't the energy that necessarily fills me up, but I'm making it kind of fun. Um, and yeah. the other thing I do is I, I do, I try and do really excellent work when I'm doing that kind of work so that I can trust it. Mm. Um, because if you, do, if you can trust it, then you don't have to keep thinking about it or worrying if you did it right. Or, um, it's like, you know, you go in, you do excellent work, you trust that work and then you don't have to go back into it. Um, yeah, that makes so much sense. I love that. My, my friend who invited me to the millionaire mindset intensive this weekend, um, we're in very different financial situations, but we have similar patterns around our money. And so having her suggest, let's have these money dates where we get to hold each other accountable to be better money managers, because historically it just wasn't something that excited us. And let's make it really freaking fun. Like let's put on the right music. Let's have a dance party around it. Let's remember that we're not having to do it alone. And we have a support system because that's another element for me is like, I don't want to do all this stuff that I don't like alone, you know? And so hearing the way that you create this portal for yourself sounds, sounds like something I could easily implement and, and curating the parts that allow me to get into the flow state can help the activity that might not normally put me in flow state be a little bit more easeful. So I really totally. like that answer. Yeah. And, um, one thing I want to point to in your question is that you're essentially asking, how do I train into a state that isn't in alignment for me? And ideally <laughs> we would always be training into states we're excited to train into. 
you know? Yeah. So this is a little bit of like, how do I do something that's out of my constitution? Um, yeah. And that's how. Yeah. And under like getting really clear on why am I training into something that's out of my constitution? Well, because feeling really good about uh, my financial situation and feeling really clear and confident and competent, that feels like it's in my constitution. I like those yeah, feelings. Totally. So this action will lead me there. Totally agree. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Mel, before we wrap up, I want to ask as a new mother to be, oh, how yeah. have you shifted how you show up in your coaching business? Um, given that you're in a brand new chapter of life. Cause I think there's a lot of people who have stories that, Oh, well that person doesn't have kids or that person doesn't this and that. And we're all humans going through the human stuff. So how has becoming a mother um, shifted your way of coaching or running a business? Um, well, the running a business aspect shifted a lot. Uh, the biggest thing I did was hire a new marketing team. So I, I've run mind lights marketing for ever. And, mm -hmm. uh, this year I hired three people to replace me. Turns out entrepreneurs do the jobs of many people and mine was three. Um, so now Mindlight has a marketing director, a partnerships director, and a marketing coordinator. Mm -hmm. And it took something to believe that I could be replaced. It took something to believe that I could find incredible talent um, because I had, and I, so I had to give myself sessions. I had to break myself out of, well, no one can do this except me, or I'm not going to be able to afford top talent. Top talent's very expensive. Um, and that's not true. It's not true. Mm. When you have something, when you have a business that's, that has a meaningful mission, that's actually what people are drawn to. And you can pay a, a regular salary. You don't have to pay the highest, highest salary, you know, or the highest, mm -hmm. highest hourly rate. Um, you can pay an average hourly rate or maybe a little bit above average, or you can actually pay a, a, a below average hourly rate when people really believe in your work. And so I had to like crack that a little bit. And I used Psyche. I used Psyche. I sat in what was turning into the baby's nursery and I shifted out of that belief into the belief that I could hire an excellent marketing team. And when that belief, mm -hmm. I can hire an excellent marketing team, landed in every single cell in my body, it didn't take very long. I wrote up the mm. full, like, every single freaking thing I want in a marketing director, put it on Indeed, found a way to, like, uh, finagle Indeed to, like, get it out there for free. I got, I don't know, 200 applications in two days, and one of them was an absolute wow. rock star, and I knew her resume was a rock star. It was, like... Former SVP of Avon sales, um, like, for example. And I immediately was like, let's get on a call. And she's now our marketing director. And she's incredible, Amazing. incredible, like carrying. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's really dreamy. So there's something mm -hmm. about knowing a kid is coming that kind of snapped me into, like, set this up so that you can be a mom, which means I need more time, basically. Yeah any more time. Yeah. So that it did that and it had me um it kind of cracked it cracked me out of limiting beliefs to be honest which I'm so grateful for. Thank you Charlie. His name is going to be Charlie. Mm -hmm. There he is Charlie. Thanks Charlie, Charlie for that one. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> From a coaching one-on-one -on -one perspective nothing drastically changed in terms of like how I practice or how I sit with a client but my rate changed. I raised my rates just a little bit and I, uh, going to take less clients in the near term and all my clients I'm going on maternity leave. They're all going on pause. So nothing super major there, but more like the bulk of my time isn't in client sessions. The, the bulk of my time is in scaling the business has been in scaling the mm -hmm. business, running the marketing, and now it will not be. And that's been the biggest shift. Yeah. Um, God, Mel, I feel like I could keep you on here all day. One more question before we wrap up. Raising your rates, was this 
a new rate for new clients or was this having a conversation with existing clients and saying, Hey, if you want to continue, my new rate is going to be this. Cause I think this is an area that a lot of new coaches have some confusion around is like, how, how do I pick a rate? How do I raise it? I have a lot to say about that. Um, <laughs> okay. So as far as picking rates, what I recommend for new coaches is pick something that you can hold stably in your body and say to someone without shaking, without feeling weird, mm. without feeling like you're stealing, without feeling like you're price gouging and without feeling like you're undervaluing yourself. So if you're brand, 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 brand new, never given a coaching session, I recommend coaching for free. I recommend giving your friends some sessions till you feel, get some experience. Then maybe you're 50 bucks an hour and then maybe you're a hundred bucks an hour and you'll start to feel when you've graduated internally. You'll start to feel when a hundred bucks an hour feels a little too cheap for some reason. And then you'll graduate yourself to 150 or 125 and then you'll graduate yourself to 175. Um, and it happens over a series of months and it's, you can't fake this. You can't cheat it. The value yeah. that you give is what people will pay. And the only way to become yeah. a valuable coach is by coaching. And the only way to begin to get clients is to start where you are. And if you have no experience, then you price yourself accurately. Um, it, it requires humility for sure. Um, but yeah. you, you do, you earn your way up through experience. It really is true. So feel for stability in your body and be honest. If you can't name, if you want to be 500 an hour and you can't even get it out of your mouth, it's obviously not going to work. Um, <laughs> and then as far as how to raise your rates, what I generally do, so I did both. I raised my rates for new clients and I raised my rates with my existing clients. I lost 50% of my clients. So that's to be expected. And then what I do is I give them, um, a month or two of, um, like transition time, like, Hey, just a heads up. My rate's going to be going up in December, whatever month. And, um, yeah. that's coming up in a couple of months. You have two months to figure it out. Like you don't have to know now, um, and think about if you want to continue or if you don't want to continue. And when we get closer to December, you can let, we can have a discussion and figure out what's right for you. Um, and, and half my clients stayed and half my clients left. And, um, that's how I recommend handling that. Yeah. Beautiful. If you could leave our listeners with one piece of encouragement or wisdom that you wish you had when you were starting out, what would it be? Study. <laughs> Study and practice. That's the actual way you get good. If you really want to be like a Tony Robbins and you want to give public demo sessions, practice giving public demo sessions, having two people watch you. Like there's no way, there's no faking your way to excellence. Yeah. Love it. Where can we find you, Mel? Oh gosh. Um, you can find me <laughs> at multiple places. You can find me at themindlight.com. Um, there's our practitioner training, Mind Light Institute, and Mind Light, Mind Light's um, coaching is, is very, very, very specific. It's based in emotions. So if you're wanting that kind of training, go there. Or if you want those kinds of sessions, go there. If you want emotional breakthroughs. And then if you want just Mel personally, um, uh, MelanieWeinberger.com is where you can find me personally. Love it. Well, this has been so nourishing and inspiring. I have like a million takeaways from today's episode and I'm sure that the listeners do too. So thank you so much for coming on and I can't wait to meet Charlie. Thank you for having me, Kim. You're incredible. You're inspirational. I love that you're doing this podcast and it was a total honor to be here with you. Thank you so much for listening and thank you to Melanie for today's incredible episode. If you got value out of today's show, do me a favor, go ahead and leave us a review on your podcast app of choice. And if you want to connect more with Melanie, then feel free to check out the show notes at theprofitablecoach.com slash zero one one for episode 11. There you can get all of the information that we talked about in today's show and learn where you can follow Melanie. If you want even more 
free value. If you are looking for support on how to magnetize those ideal clients, then I encourage you to check out our freebie over at theprofitablecoach.com slash freebie. There you can get access to our life coach launch mini course. And again, it is free. So I appreciate you guys tuning in and I can't wait to bring you next week's episode. It's going to be a little bit different. So get excited.